This is the second lecture for MA 1012. In this lecture, we want to think about ge uh, complex numbers geometrically. So we recall that we write our complex numbers as Z is X plus I, Y is having real imaginary parts, like for example, um, 1 plus 2I. Already the notation using X and Y as the letters suggests that we think about the XY plane, or just the plane with the variables written as X and Y. And so if we had a point like this, uh, we could associate to it uh, a point with coordinates x and y, 1, 2 equals x, y. And so each point x plus i, y is thought of as just being a point in the plane x, y. So for example, this point 1, 2 has coordinates 1 and then 1, 2 up here. So that's the, the point x, y is 1, 2. But from now on, we'll think of it as the complex number. We'll identify this and this. So in other words, we'll say that they're equal. Um, uh, or another way to say, think of it is simply that uh, when we have to draw a point, instead of drawing it as x comma y, we'll draw the point as x plus i y. So the same picture, but using instead of this notation x comma y, it'll be x plus i y. That complex number is thought of as being uh, that point. When you think of it that way, then it becomes clear that we have the um, addition law for vectors. That our, our addition law was to add real and imaginary parts, but we add vectors by adding their parts. And so our addition law was if we had a, a z and we had a w. Um, our addition law was the same law as for vectors, which you can draw in a picture by a parallelogram. So that must be z plus w. Uh, again, because our, our addition law was to add real parts together and add imaginary parts together. So we make the real part of the sum of the real parts and the imaginary part of the sum of the imaginary parts. But vector addition just consists of saying that each part is the sum of the, of, of the sum is the sum of the corresponding parts of the vectors. So it must be exactly vector addition. So if we think of that as a vector and that as a vector, then this is the vector that is the sum of the two. So it must be the sum complex number as well. One also gets from this the so-called triangle inequality, which is that the, this guy is uh, in length never, it's never longer to go straight between two points, sorry, between the origin here and this point here. It's never longer to go that way than to go somewhere in the middle. So if you go straight from here to Dublin, it's, it's certainly not going to take you longer than if you went first to Cove and then to Dublin. Um, so uh, that gives us the triangle inequality that if you go straight, the length of going straight is uh, never larger than the length of first going along this one and then going along that one, or the other way around. That's actually this one and then that one. So, um, so you can see that you get the triangle equality geometrically, which is a bit harder to get algebraically. Uh, another obvious observation from that point of view is simply that um, the uh, magnitude of, of the difference of two vectors is the distance between them. So if we think of it that way, then the distance between two complex numbers, um, so if we have here z and we have here w, then the length, this is between the length this way from z to w, and that would have to be the length of that is exactly uh, magnitude z minus w. That's true of any vectors, so it has to be true in this picture as well. It gives us some obvious geometric facts about how these things work. If you considered as an example, um, the equation that magnitude z minus 1 plus i has to be 2. What is that as a geometric object? What are all the solutions? If you think about it algebraically in terms of x's and y components of the z, it's a bit of a mess to spell out. But geometrically, we take this point 1 plus i, so one real part, one imaginary part, and putting it right there, that's 1 plus i. And then we're saying the distance between z and 1 plus i has to be 2. So we take all the points of distance 2, which should include this point and obviously this point, and should be a circle. If I could draw a decent circle around that point, it would look something like that. Uh, that's not a very good picture, but that's supposed to be the idea. It's a circle of radius 2. Right There's the radius. It says the distance between z and this center point is 2. So the points of distance 2 from a given point should be, if I could draw a bit better, uh, it would be a circle. 
Um, so it's uh, possible to interpret uh, these algebraic expressions geometrically in these pictures and immediately get out what the answer is. Um, we could similarly make an example where we look at something like the magnitude of z minus some complex number uh, equals the magnitude of z minus some other complex number. Um, that just says the distance with, uh, to this complex number is equal to that complex number. So we have an unknown complex number z, but we know these two things about it, these two distances. And so what we could do is we could write down where this point is, 1 and then 1, 2, 3, something like that. So that's this point, 1 plus 3i. And then we have to 5 plus i, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and then plus 1i here. So that's 5 plus i. And then very roughly trying to get a rough idea of where this is, where my, uh, my, my drawing is supposed to be, um, I could say, well, if I take the um, line segment between these two, the middle of it's about here. And then uh, I want to find all the points that are uh, distance to, I want point upon point z so that its distance to this point is equal to its distance to this point. And that's going to be the perpendicular line along here. So the solutions are on this line, not this one, but this one, um, because uh, those are the points where the distance, um, if you're on the point on this line here, then your distance this way is equal to your distance this way. It's an equilateral triangle. So that gives you, um, sorry, it's an isosceles triangle. So that gives you equal distance here and here. And that's exactly what the algebraic expression is saying. So we can begin to see that it's very powerful to forget about algebra and start thinking about geometry. Uh, because algebraically, this would be an enormous mess to expand out and find what z could be. But if you think about it geometrically, you can often see the answer right away. A more sophisticated uh, approach to, the, to study the geometry of complex numbers comes when we think about um, about them in terms of distances and angles. Unlike ordinary real numbers, a complex number then sits in the plane, so there's an x and a y axis, and each point x, y, as we said before, we don't think of as a, we don't draw it as x comma y in parentheses, we just write it as x plus i, y, think of it as a complex number. It then has some information about it geometrically. It has two pieces of information, how far away it is from the origin. This is the origin, which is the zero complex number here. And we can ask how far this is. We can also ask, what angle is this? And once you know the angle here, you know how far to go up along around the, the circle. And you know the, this distance here, you know the radius of that circle, then you know exactly where that point is. We have to always make sure to use the mathematician's convention that angles are measured counterclockwise. usually starting starting at the horizontal axis. Okay, so we start at this axis here and we go around that way measuring an angle. Um, and it's traditional uh, to call the angle the angle of a complex number z equals x plus i y plus i y as measured in this picture, this angle here is also called the argument. The argument, and usually written something like arg z. Um, this is a very traditional notation. A lot of the notation and terminology of complex analysis uh, is very old and, uh, and and very odd. There's there's always an important ambiguity here when you when you measure an angle. Um, Typically, if, if you only know where this point is, you typically you tend to measure the angle as being this one here. But in principle, there's nothing that stops us from measuring it by going 18 times around the circle and then to here. Um, that seems like a silly thing to do, but it does actually come up as a bit of a problem because sometimes we end up dealing with varying complex numbers. If this number starts to vary, it might wind around many, many, many times. And so we end up measuring its argument going up, 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 and allowing it to have, be a multiple of, of 360 degrees. Um, I should always point, I should point out that we never use degrees, uh, no degrees. We don't like degrees. Degrees were invented by the Babylonians and they're a very bad idea. Um, we should, of course, measure angles always uh, between 0 and 2 pi. So uh, 0 uh, to 2 pi, uh, or 360 degree rotation is a 2 pi rotation in radians. 
we'll always use radiance. We can never use degrees. There are good reasons for that, because the formulas become unbearably awful if we use degrees or any other system of measuring angles. Radians are the only way that works well with calculus. So, um, but we will allow the possibility of an argument uh, argz could um, be um, uh, increasing by increased by uh, by two pi or decreased by two pi. Could we, when you go 360 around, you sometimes want to include that as part of the arg, and sometimes not. So, in fact, argz is ambiguous. It's not really a properly defined mathematical quantity. Um, because sometimes as we move the point around, we want to allow that arc to go up by two pi multiples, and sometimes we don't. Um, if uh, So the usual convention is if, if we force uh, our choice of arg to be, um, to be uh, between 0 and uh, 2 pi, so you can, again, you can pick it uh, by a change by 2 pi multiples. Um, sorry, yeah, not 0 to 2 pi, minus pi uh, to pi. Uh, if you force uh, to be the arg to be minus pi and pi, then we'll say that that's the principal argument. And uh, again, uh, you have to apologize for the fact that it's called argument at all. It obviously should just be called angle, but traditionally angles are called arguments in complex analysis, and lengths are called moduli, um, which is very unfortunate. We're stuck with that. Um, also. Um, well, yeah, so I said 0 to 2 pi, and I should really have said minus pi to pi. So we're going to work with usually with angles between minus pi and pi um, uh, as our principal ang our angles, but our principal arguments. But sometimes we need to allow those arguments to go beyond uh, those limits, uh, those, those uh, beyond outside of that interval. And so there will be times when we'll use this arg symbol to represent uh, some other uh, values for arguments that are outside of that interval. Let's start thinking about some, some, some actual arguments. What do they really look like when you do these things? Um, if you look at, um, you take a simple example, um, you can go one step an, out, one unit in the x, and then one unit in the y, and you end up up here, and you have a complex number, 1 plus i. What's the argument for that complex number? What angle is that? Well, that's halfway between this point and this point by angle. It's halfway uh, to a 90 degree angle, so it's uh, pi over 4. So the argument of 1 plus i is pi over 4. And again, that's the principal argument because we could allow arguments to go up by 2 pi multiples, and that would be perfectly legal too. Um, so that's the argument of that, of that complex number. And it's modulus. Um, the modulus of the complex number is just its length. And we know by Pythagoras that should be the square root of the sum of the squares of the real dimensional parts. Remember, this imaginary part is not i. The imaginary part is it's 1 times i. So there's a 1 here for the imaginary part. It's, uh, the, the imaginary part is the y part. y here is 1. So that's this guy, which is 1 squared plus 1 squared. 1 squared is 1. 1 plus 1 is 2. So root 2. OK, so that's uh, calculating out both the argument and the modulus which is the length, modulus. Um, so we want to then put those together um, in a more general setting. Uh, let's suppose we had um, uh, a general complex number with some angle, um, so some argument, in other words, which is some theta. And then um, also it has some, some modulus, which is r. So we'll let r be a symbol for the modulus and theta be a symbol for the argument. Um, then we know how to find the point, which is distance r from the origin, with angle theta. We know that its x coordinate has to be r cos theta from trigonometry. We know its y coordinate has to be r sine theta. We know that from trigonometry, which hopefully you remember very clearly um, from presumably from last year. But it, it's but its value as a complex number is 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 as said is x plus i y. So now trigonometry enables us to substitute these in and actually compute the out what the z is. So by trigonometry we know once the we know the length r and the angle theta we can calculate the x and y position of the point x plus i y. Its x coordinates y coordinate or r cos theta r sine theta. Then uh, its actual complex number description is r cos theta plus i times r sine theta. So that gives an explicit expression 
for the complex number that has a given modulus and a given argument. Um, so there's, only, there's one and only one such complex number, and that's it. Um, we could also, if we like, simplify the formula a little bit by factoring out the r. So it becomes r, the, the modulus, the length of the complex number, times cosine of the angle plus i sine of the angle, or argument. Okay. So that's how we can explicitly construct the complex number, which has a given modulus and a given argument. When you try to go the other way around from uh, taking a given modulus and an and argument to constructing the number, if you try to go the other way around, start with a number and construct what are the what are the uh, modulus and the argument, it's a bit trickier um, and it's easy to mess it up. So you always have to draw a picture, otherwise you're going to mess it up. Um, so, um, for example, um, we'd want to uh, compute out some uh, some uh, simple uh, arguments and angles, uh, arguments and, and, and moduli for some simple examples. If we were to take a number down here, so this is the number um, minus 1 minus i, which is as uh, uh, an x value of minus 1, y value of minus 1, so minus 1 minus i. And we try to work out what is the the argument. You can see in the picture what the argument has to be. You have to go around this right angle, then another right angle, and then half of a right angle to here. So you can add those up, and you should get pi over 2, pi over 2, pi over 4, or if you like pi plus pi over 4. So it's going to be pi plus pi over 4 equals the argument of minus 1 of minus 1 minus i. Okay, so that's going to be, if you so that's 4 pi over 4 and 1 pi over 4, so it's 5 pi over 4. And that's the right argument. Uh, as the, the no lecture notes point out, you could easily mess it up if you just tried to plug in some kind of trig formula, and, and you might mess it up. So draw the picture. Um, I don't want to go through the messing up of uh, the process of messing it up and getting the wrong answer. But if you draw the picture, you can usually see where you're talking about. And you start here and you wind around until you get to where you want to go. And so you can see what the correct uh, value should be for that argument to get the principal argument. So you get the right answer. But actually, our principal, sorry, that's not our principal argument, that's an argument. Our principal argument is supposed to be between minus pi and pi, and that's obviously too large. So that's an argument. An argument. Um, Sorry, I was going to also do the principal argument, so let's just let's do that as well. Um, we want to say then for the principal argument, so that's one way to get an argument, but obviously it's not getting us the principal one because it's too large, it's bigger than pi. So if we want to get an argument that's between uh, minus pi and uh, minus pi and pi, um, then all right, then uh, then we want to go the other way. Um, so we take the same complex number minus one minus i, and we start here, we go this way, and we get a different value of the argument. So as I said, that the term, the word, the expression argz isn't really well defined. It doesn't really have a mathematical precise meaning. It's the argument that we're using at the moment to describe, the angle we're using to describe this, this point. But you could decide to use this angle, which is perfectly legal, but it's not the principal argument. We could use this angle, and that's also an argument. So going this way, you do a right angle and then a half a right angle. So that's pi over 2 plus pi over 4. But you're going backwards. You're supposed to go counterclockwise. But if you go clockwise, then you're going backwards. So it's minus uh, pi over 2 to do this bit, and then a, my, pi over 4. Uh, so a right angle and then a half a right angle. And so putting those together, you get minus 3 pi over 4. So this is two different values of the same argz for the same point, And that's why this is dangerous and confusing. You can easily get the wrong one uh, for a particular problem. But those are both called argz, right? This argz for the same z is not equal to this argz for the same z, right? It's the same point z. But we've got two different quantities, which we're both calling argz, because you're allowed to use the name argz to mean any angle for that given complex number point. And so it's easy to mess it up, and you have to draw the picture to make sure you're getting the one you want. Now, I, I said previously that we had a kind of um, geometric interpretation of the addition law. The addition law is, is uh, very straightforward, um, that we have a complex number z, and we have a complex number uh, w, and we think of them as little vectors coming out of the origin, and then uh, we add them by making a parallelogram 
um, and that becomes z plus w, and that's the usual law for adding forces or adding vectors. Um, but what about multiplying? And then it turns out that multiplying is not so straightforward uh, from this point of view, but it becomes straightforward now from the different point of view that we've now adopted of thinking about uh, arguments and angles. Um, because uh, what we'll find is that you add, if you take a z and a w, so if I take a z and a, let's use another color for a w, um, w is going to have some angle and z is going to have some other angle. Then it turns out that what you do is you just add those angles. So I take this angle uh, for the w and then add the angle for the z and I should get uh, the angle for that's not a great picture, but that'll be the angle for z times w. Um, so z times w be somewhere over here. Um, it'll have the sum of the angles, so the angles add up. Let's just see why that's true. Um, so if we exp explain it all in terms of the um, expand everything, um, in terms of, uh, of of the multiplication law, we write it as uh, uh, this guy has some some angle and some length, so it has a modulus and it has an argument. And then this other guy has, we have to use new letters for them, so let's call this S instead of R, because we need something like a letter R, and we need something like a letter theta, so let's call it cos phi plus I sine phi. Then I can multiply them together by just doing arithmetic without, or algebra, without thinking geometrically at all. ZW must be you multiply the r times the s and get r times s. Now you just have to expand all this junk out. It's cos theta cos phi, and then plus the i times this plus i times this, and then it'll be i times i uh, is minus sine theta sine phi. And then let's write down the i parts. So there's this is an i, and this is an i. So cos theta sine phi plus sine theta cos phi. So if we expanded it all out and made it into this horrible mess, there's the real part, there's the imaginary part, there's the lengths. And all we have to do is to uh, is to remember trig identities. There's a trig identity that covers exactly this real part here. There's a different trig identity that covers exactly this one here, and hopefully you remember those trig identities, but in case you don't, let's just write down what they are. It's rs times this whole mess here becomes just the cosine of uh, theta plus phi. And this mess here, so that's the red bit, um, and then uh, this bit here becomes plus i times the sine of theta plus phi. That's the green bit. So you can see um, that uh, using trig, and you have to remember that red identity from trigonometry that turns into this, and this green one here turns into that. So if you remember that from trigonometry, then you get this really nice fact, which is that uh, this is the sum of the angles. So we get ZW has an argument, which is the argument of Z plus the argument of W, at least if you measure the arguments in the right way, because we have to worry about 2 pi multiples and all that stuff. But anyway, so uh, the, in other words, angles add because I had an angle for z, it had an angle, an argument of theta, w had an argument of phi, and this zw has an argument of theta plus phi, theta plus phi. Um, so the, ar the ang arguments add, and the lengths uh, multiply, which is actually an arithmetic law that we uh, said previously, and it's kind of surprising. It's not completely obvious. It takes a bit of work to, to check that this that the product of the z times w length is the length, product of the lengths. Um, so uh, so the, the lengths multiply and the angles or add, or if you like, the moduli multiply and the arguments add. Now that immediately gives us, if replacing w by 1 over w, that uh, the argument of z over w has to be the argument of z minus the argument of w. Uh, then, so when you have um, ratios, you get a difference in angles. And of course, we already said that when you have a ratio of lengths, you get uh, a le sorry, a length of a ratio is the ratio of the lengths. Um, so, uh, so that ma makes for a very easy geometric picture of what's happening here. Um, the, 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 the 
product of lengths. Well, maybe that's not so geometric, but this is the sum of the angles. That's more. That's pretty clear geometrically what that looks like. And again, maybe I should emphasize one of the reasons why we like to have these sort of geometric rules is that we can often just see in our head what the answer is uh, without having to do the arithmetic. Or we can, uh, like we did previously when we saw how to how to solve various complicated equations for things like circles and lines in the complex plane. The algebraically, they're immensely complicated equations but geometrically become immediately clear. And that's going to happen here as well, that we're going to have expressions that involve products, but we're going to be able to see something about the geometry of how that product works um, by saying, well, the argument has to just be sums of arguments. And so that'll make certain um, geometric arguments available that make it uh, easy to avoid doing, doing uh, calculations out, or at least to make it clear that we're getting the calculations right because we can see what's happening with these, with these angles. So just to see it in a simple example, we could look at um, something like, um, again, our, our the simplest example is something like uh, 1 plus i. Um, and uh, we said that that had, an, had uh, a modulus that was root 2 and an argument, principal argument, that was pi over 4, because it's halfway to a pi over 2 right angle. Um, you're going to have to remember your, your radians. Um, how radians work, right? That uh, this is zero radians, pi over two radians, pi radians, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so um, so just as a parenthetical remark. Okay, so then if we if we then multiply this thing by itself, um, our rules should tell us how the uh, arguments uh, work out and and how the the lengths, how the moduli work out. So uh, that's 1 plus i times 1 plus i. Let's just check if it's all working. So you get 1 times 1, and then i times i is minus 1, and then you get plus i plus i, so minus uh, plus 2i, and those cancel, so you get 2i. And so we can find that the length of 1 plus i squared is 2. Uh, the length of this guy is the square of the sum of the squares of the real imaginary parts. Uh, that gives us two. So that guy's two, which is exactly what we expected because we had a length of root two and we squared it. So it should be exactly root two squared. And so that checks out with the law that we've learned that you can take the length of the modulus of a complex number and when you multiply two complex numbers together here, we're squaring, so we're multiplying them by itself, uh, that that should multiply the the moduli by themselves. The argument of 2i, where is 2i? It always helps to just look at the picture. Um, it's, uh, it's 2i, it's 0 plus 2i, no real, no real part, and, and 2 is an imaginary part. So it's right up there, and that angle is of course exactly, it's in our picture here, it's exactly pi over 2, so it's exactly pi over 2, and that is 2 times the argument of uh, 1 plus i. And so that checks with our rule because we said the argument should add. Uh, we multiply the number by itself. We should add its argument to itself. You get the argument twice, and that should be the argument of the result. So it does work. Okay, so we've just checked it in a simple example to convince ourselves that we can see it all working out. We could do more complicated examples if we remembered a little more trigonometry.